So uh, what's up, man? How are you? How are you keeping? All good, man. All good. Surviving the isolation. How are you doing yourself? Yeah, same. Same. Surviving it, I suppose. Yeah, is what we could say. Getting through it. So and, what's up? What's the what's the topic of conversation today? Uh, we'll talk a bit maybe about yourself, about yourself and about the gym and maybe some other bits and pieces and uh, mm-hmm. maybe there'll be some just general, I suppose, fight talk in there as well. Awesome. So, um, uh, was there many, have you been affected, has the, in terms of the gym, like, has, uh, was there many fights cancelled and stuff uh, but due to the coronavirus? Yeah, we had a, we actually had a really busy season planned. Uh, I had a, couple of lads fighting for titles they literally the the week that like the lockdown was kind of coming into effect uh avenue fares was fighting for a title over in the uk pally ham was defending a title in the uk he was also fighting for another title in cage legacy um yeah we had we had a load of fights we we actually we had taken a few months off uh between i'd say maybe the end of November right up until March and like this was literally going to be the, the kickoff of a very long season for us going right up until August um, so couldn't it, it, it was a bad it was bad timing but look it's just been postponed there's nothing there's nothing uh, nothing too serious we're all we're all still alive for now yeah and was it was that kind of break was that was that a planned break to to not have many fights between November and, and March yeah, we tend to do things in, in, I suppose, clumps of fights because the one thing about training for a, a fight during a fight camp is that you're not really improving that much. You're, you're getting fitter, you're getting sharper, you're, you're locking down some details and things. But every so often you do need some time as, as a group or as a team or as a, um, a, a sub-team that you need to step up the level. So you need to take the pressure off yourself so that you can experiment with new techniques, new systems, and test them out on your training partners. And then if they work, then you can implement them into your fight strategy after that. But if you're constantly in fight camp, you never get that chance to level up, you know? Yeah, so like, when you're in fight camp, you nearly don't want any wasted days. Like if you, if you go into training and you try something and it's not working, it's like that could be a day wasted. But so when you take that time out, then you can you have a chance to, to play around and if, if it's not a if it doesn't work and you didn't have the best day in training it's it's not the end of the world. Yeah and you don't have to worry about cutting weight that week or uh, during that time either. So there there's a bit of a, a mental reset during that time as well. I think the the best example of one of our guys that got a, a boost from that is Patrick Lehan who who uh he literally fought from like the, the moment he turned seventeen he was eligible to fight in uh, teen rules MMA in in in, in a, a kind of a commercial show and he, he did straight away and he, he won his first fight by by knockout in the second round I think and then he went on and fought literally every every month or two months or eight weeks or whatever he had a fight right up through the following two years and he accumulated an, like, an enormous amount of fights in a very very short time and there was a there was a show Cage Legacy in Cork, uh, April twenty twenty nineteen, yeah, April twenty, yeah, and he was scheduled to fight on that show, and the show was postponed, and that was the straw that brought the cameras back. It was like he he was like all geared up for a fight, and then they said, oh no, it's another three weeks away, and uh, you could see immediately his his energy just went, oh Jesus, here we go. You know, another another three weeks. He was set to go. He was ready to have his fight, have a dirty kebab, and then get back into camp again. But because that kebab was postponed by three weeks, his energy just took an awful dive. And um, a, he he fought he fought in the postponed show. He lost. His opponent came from behind to take the to take the that fight from him uh, in the third round, and he he had to take a break. He, so he took he took like three three four months off. When he came back, then he came back a totally different animal altogether. Um, and um, yeah, just hasn't lost the fight since. Yeah, so like you said, like probably 
it was probably a real, would you say it was a really good learning curve the fact he was so active throughout the, throughout that time that uh mm-hmm. you know constantly been in competition but like you said it, it, it kind of hit the wall then to where it's not mm-hmm. the most sustainable to be that active yeah he burned out and it, it, he burned out mostly from the dieting it wasn't from the training it was mostly just from trying to maintain a weight and uh just constantly depriving himself of of, of treats and that that mentally wore him down and uh he just needed a break from it. He took a break from it. He actually decided he was going to take a break for like four or five months. And within one month, he was begging me to, to, to book a fight for him again. And I was like, no, you, you said three months. Let's give it three months. And, and, uh, but when he came back, he was so hungry, uh, not for treats, but for fights. Okay. Uh, it was great. And do you find that in the gym, kind of having everybody on kind of somewhat the same schedule kind of helps like, like you say if, you're, if everybody isn't if you're not taking any if none of the gym is taking fights for an extended period of time and then there's a, a month then where everybody is staying fairly active do you think that kind of helps the overall vibe and feel in the gym definitely because even though it's a solo sport um for competition time you can't do a, a training session without all your teammates with you so if we say one lad is fighting in October and uh, like three others are fighting in December. The guys in December aren't on, they're, they're not focused until, you know, six or eight weeks, whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and then the guy that's fighting in October is basically doing his training camp on his own. Um, and then when he's finished his fight, he's not really around for the other guys. Then, you know, not, no, they all are still around, but I'm talking like on point, like in, in, in that kind of fight focus mode. So, Trying to coordinate, trying to get everybody on the same card would be ideal. On, on, the same, on the same tournament would be ideal. But if we can't, then in and around two, three weeks at a time, uh, we get a, a lash of people fighting in, 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 we say, two weekends. Then we try for another month after that, another three, four weeks after that again. And, and we try and keep it like that. And then if, we, if, if we're taking a break, we're all taking a break. Yeah, like that. There's there's something maybe about having fellas in the trenches with you, like guys who who know how you're feeling when you're in the, that mm-hmm. last couple of weeks in the training camp. Like you say, it's diff- a different feeling if, like you say, one guy is he, he's he's enjoying life as well as well as do, yeah. doing a bit of training. But when you have the guy then who's in the trenches, it's good to have yeah. somebody there with you. Yeah, yeah, they have to be coordinated in 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 their focus as well. And you know that from from Taekwondo from. You know, when, when you have a whole squad training, like doing squad training sessions in the, the 10 weeks that lead up to a tournament and everybody is traveling all over the country to meet each other for uh, a few hours in a community hall, you build a, a, a kind of like a team spirit that way. And uh, that, that helps the overall team in the end. So like just because we're, it's not a similar, it's not, a, not yet, it's not the same in MMA um commercial shows in that like you might have you have one fight and you might only have three of the 15 or 20 guys of, of the gym on that card it's different like a, a tournament where everybody that's on your team is competing on the same weekend or the same week or whatever it is it's a different vibe but the the training can't be different it has to be the same it has to be the whole team going through the effort together um, and, and everybody pulling in the same direction just the same and so, I, actually, how did you then get? How did you yourself get involved in uh, in martial arts? How did the journey start? So my parents were my coaches. When I, uh, my mother and father, been doing karate since since I think it's like mid seventies. Um, they're fifty years at it now at this stage. Uh, so when I was like my, my older brother and sister, they're they're like. 12 and 14 years older than me and they were already involved in karate so when I when I was born I had no choice I was going to be a karate guy there was no there was no two ways about it you know um I I did the usual kids classes from seven or eight upwards um I retired at the grand old age of 10 and then I saw um Jean-Claude Van Damme kickboxer I think I, I rented it I think I might have rented it from Extra Vision or something like that, um, and that just that just fired me up. And I went back to karate at the age of I think about thirteen or fourteen. Haven't stopped since. That was uh, that was that was the movie that did it for me. And 
I went through like my karate career. I got my black belt when I was 17, I think. Uh, did all my international tournaments um, between the ages of, we say, 16 and 22, 23. Um, then I watched a, a documentary on Discovery Channel called uh, XMA, Extreme Martial Arts. Um, Mike Chatteranta, but the, the Blue Power Ranger from uh, Power Rangers Light Speed Rescue. Um, and this was, this was like crazy science, science fiction type animation, animatronics that they were using to, uh, to make skeletons fight each other with, with full, like it was motion tracking real athletes and then using CGI to make them into skeletons to fight each other. And it showed all the joints and the, the different parts of the body and how they moved when you were doing jump back, spinning kicks and all sorts of crazy stuff. I, I was just blown away by it. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to go to America uh, on a J1 visa while I was in college. And I went straight over to Mike Chatteranta and I said, I want, I, want, I want in on this. So I started studying XMA at that time, um, which is a combination of gymnastics and traditional martial arts. I couldn't even do a forward roll at that stage. I, I was so, so badly able to do gymnastics. And when I went over there, there was like six year old kids and they were doing like 40 backflips in a row and like double layout somersaults on, on carpet. And I was just crazy, but I, I, I took a crash course in that went uh, down the line. Then of uh, when I came back to Ireland, I started making like really low budget amateur um, action movies. For, for the want of a better word. And a, a group of us actually found each other. Um, we called ourselves A Click Productions. Um, a Don Loche, uh, Mark Redmond, uh, th there was a bunch of us. They were, we were all from, literally, we all kind of had a very similar story. We all came from different backgrounds. There was kickboxers, there was taekwondo guys, there was karate guys, there was um, acrobats, gymnasts, dancers, um, circus clowns, everyone. And... Everybody just seemed to be on this kind of um, action choreography movie vibe. And uh, we had this uh, troupe going for ages. And we used to, we used to meet up in the Ballincollig Gymnastics Hall uh, every Sunday evening and, and spend three hours doing backflips and somersaults and fight choreography. And uh, every few weeks we'd make a movie. And like some of those movies were really, really good. Um, and a... It kind of, I suppose, throughout that whole time, I was watching um, UFC and uh, like all, all Pride and all the rest of them. There wasn't really a club to do it, but uh, we were all, you know, fans of the sport. In 2010, we got the opportunity to open up our own gym. Um, and at that stage, then I decided, right, if we're going to do full time martial arts, you can't, like, in this day and age, you can't not be involved in MMA. So we just decided we'd get stuck into it. Um, and, uh, yeah, we went in with literally, I, I had my karate, a bit of gymnastics, a bit of action choreography. That was, that was my full experience in mixed martial arts. Um, within six months of opening the gym, I got the opportunity to fight on Cage Warriors, which is absolutely mental because I was like, it, it, nobody should be should be fighting on even like like a, a local novice show without without some grappling experience or wrestling experience i had none um and i thought it was going to be easy i thought it was going i thought i was just going to go in kick some fella in the head and just be famous overnight you know um and i got a, a very very rude awakening within two minutes i was taken down and pounded to a pulp um, and that was my uh, that was my introduction to MMA. So I decided I have to go learn this jujitsu stuff. That was 2011, and yeah, just been kind of learning our tr our trade since. I suppose that was probably the, that was kind of the time it was. It was if you were a specialist, maybe like your background was just in karate. So just step in and uh, and see how you get on, and try and use your style, and see how nearly your style or background works against somebody else's style or background. Yeah. And I wouldn't yeah, have made, absolutely. You know, time, even at that time, I wouldn't imagine amateur was, was a thing even back then, if you were going onto a cage warriors card. 
Um, there was a uh, well, no, it was definitely amateur, but it was it was it wasn't it wasn't amateur as we know today. It was like um, there, there was this similar to Muay Thai. There was A class was pro, uh, B class was semi pro, C class, and there was a D class. Then with no headshots on the ground, and uh, I think I think my my fight was C class, which would have been um, the equivalent of full amateur now, um, but back then it would have been. It would it wouldn't have even been called amateur. It would have been just called C class. Um, but yeah, like at the time, uh, there, there was there was no like uh, the the MMA clinic had just opened up in Forge Hill uh, around about the same time as we opened up, um, and they they had that link to Cage Warriors. They were like Cage Warriors and MMA clinic are owned by the same person, and um, so so they had a they had a good team, uh, good structure going over there. But for us, for the rest, like for for my crew, we hadn't a clue what we were doing. We were just literally watching uh, UFC events and trying to figure out what what an underhook was, you know, and and just chancing our arm. And and we thought we'd be fine. We thought we thought it'd be easy just to stay on your feet, you know. Um, yeah. Like as if I had a choice to stay on my feet. Like uh, anybody, like if if you come into an, an MMA arena and you haven't done jujitsu or or wrestling. And you're facing somebody with even six months experience. They will just take you down with ease. They'll control you and they'll relieve you of your consciousness with no effort whatsoever. You cannot, cannot, cannot exist in MMA without a very, very solid uh, jiu-jitsu and wrestling game. Uh, and I learned that very, very quickly. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 if striking is your only... Uh, well, I think it's kind of even uh, to some degree. Even if don't, if you only have one, if you only have one discipline, basically, I think you're going to be you're, you're probably going to be found out because there's so many different ways that the fight can go. That mm-hmm. one discipline is, isn't isn't enough. Yep, absolutely, hundred percent. I, I should have known that by then, but I didn't, and it took me a while to figure it out. But we got there in the end. We're 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 doing okay now. Actually, there was a uh, uh, some uh, 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 Dwayne Crowley from the Taekwondo. Or, yeah, t- uh, he had a kind of a similar um, arc to to me as well. He came through the the traditional striking uh, method, and and uh, he made his uh, MMA debut. I think it was in might have been in Cage Legacy about five years ago. Um, I'd have to double check that now. But uh, yeah, similar. I think uh, uh, like I I know when I made my debut. All of my karate colleagues, they were like, "Oh, this is going to be easy. Those guys don't know how to fight. They're just brawlers, you know. You, your, you know, your your technique and your your crisp striking will will, you know, will, will surface to the to the top, and you'll triumph. All this kind of shit, like. But you know, uh, yeah, I and, and I and I know at the time when 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 Dwayne was fighting, um, I was writing for the Echo, I think at the time I was writing for the Echo, and uh, I had lots of my colleagues uh, from the Taekwondo world as well were, were like, how do you think his chances are? And I'm like, oh no, I hope, his, I hope he's been practicing his jiu-jitsu. And I know he, he was he was doing a bit of jiu-jitsu. He had a lot more jiu-jitsu than I had. He, he was better prepared. But uh, yeah, he, he kind of had a similar similar experience to me in that like you come up against a, a stronger grappler and all those years of of kicking and punching and and drilling and everything of that just go out the window if if somebody is just holding you down there's just nothing you can do and it's it's a it's a horrible feeling i'd imagine yeah is there anybody is there many people is anybody still in the gym from kind of those early days that have been still tr- training or is it all kind of a- uh, yeah um we have uh, somebody one of my lads that used to fight alongside of me at the time was uh Yerick kelly um so he's uh, he's back on the scene after a few years. He he actually tore his ACL. Um, I, I'm not sure how to, I, I have had conflicting stories as to how he tore his ACL. Some people tell me he he, he tore it in in a soccer match. Some people tell me he tore it in a fight outside uh, Hillbillies by the fountain. But um, I'll leave him tell you that story himself. But yeah, he's back on the scene. He was uh, he's one of the OGs. Um, who was? Uh, That some like a lot of the guys that would have been fighting when I was fighting uh, went on to to have pro careers. I I I didn't. I I wasn't very good at it, so I had to hang the gloves up eventually. But um, 
I fought Sean Tobin, who's who, who fought in um, who runs Trials Martial Arts down in uh, Mitchestown now, and he he fought in Bellator recently uh, uh, last year. Um, so like like a lot a lot of a lot of that generation would have gone uh, gone on to be pro fighters uh, at this stage, but uh, nobody's still at the amateur level. <laughs> did you did you always maybe feel that you had uh, more of a, a knack for for coaching? Maybe more so than the actual being competitive. Um, I thought I had a chance. To be honest, I, I fancied myself to have a bit of a chance. But um, like I made my MMA debut uh, a month shy of my thirtieth birthday. So um, and I had a I had a um, I had a few injury issues as well. I prolapsed a disc in my neck uh, just before, like we say, about a year before my first fight. I recovered from that to make to to make my MMA debut. Um, a year after that fight, I prolapsed a disc in my lower back. So they were two really catastrophic injuries that kept me out for a year at a time. Um, so between coming to it too late and uh, injuries and, and just basically having my, my confidence knocked as well and not generally not knowing what I was doing, um, I had to like I had to really take a long, hard look at myself when I, uh, uh, in the earlier days and figure out okay do you know what I, I I'm so far behind on grappling and wrestling it's going to take me a couple of years to catch up so yeah I I, I kind of knew straight away like I knew at that stage once I lost a couple of fights I, I was like yeah this, there's no point in continuing to to to, to try and uh, catch up when I'm so far behind I'll just refocus get back and uh, learn 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 the discipline correctly and then maybe the next generation of guys come up will carry the flag for the gym, and that's where we're at right now, where the guys are, the guys are doing a great job. Um, so they don't need me to to fight anymore. Yeah, so like I said, like lay coming to the game, and then some serious injuries there actually that that um, that, mm. that could stop, that could stop you at any point really. Yeah, I was lucky. I was lucky. I was lucky that we had um, resident physios in the gym that 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 were able to kind of. Uh, kind of keep me walking and moving and uh, eventually kind of uh, work it out, you know. So uh, Marco Sullivan from Body Mechanics was, uh, was, was the one that kind of kept me moving. And uh, eventually I, I was able to kind of just make a full recovery from both injuries and they, they don't bother me anymore. Um, but I'll be 40 next year, so I, I don't think I'll be stepping back into the cage unless they bring this veterans division in. If they bring the veterans division in, I might be tempted. <laughs> and uh, so you mentioned already that um, the, the kind of the setup in the amateur has kind of changed um, in the mm. form. Um, yeah. Would you think that's maybe well, it's much better now than it would have been back then? The way. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. It's so much better. Uh, the platform for for amateur athletes in this day and age, it, 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 like the athletes that you're going to see at the pro level in five years' time, will make absolute you know they, they'll, it's just a game changer the the level of of the guys coming through because like when when i was competing and and for the guys who are pro now a lot of the guys who who are pro now may have only had between five and ten amateur fights because that was just the trend you you go on a tear you you win you, you're five and all as an amateur you're six or seven and all as an amateur oh you must turn pro now it's it's you're you're too good for for the amateur scene now and that was it that would that like you know um that that was the norm and, and there was nothing wrong with that because that was the time it was now when you consider the guys who are uh, doing the circuit doing the IMF uh, championships there's like there's guys with forty fifty amateur fights no intentions of turning pro. Um, like until until they're multiple world multiple times world champions and and then when they turn pro they are just killing it they're absolutely smashing guys um, so yeah the, the 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 scene has completely changed it's kind of it's it's almost becoming like um, uh, the kind of boxing scene like we say the likes of Katie Taylor who very similar to the boxing an absolutely dominant champion. And then when she turns pro, she just has like almost no challenge at, at, at pro for the first few fights, certainly. And uh, she can become one of the greatest female boxers of all time. But a lot of that was built up on her 100 plus or I don't even know how many amateur fights she had, but she certainly had 
more than seven or eight. Yeah. And do you, th- do you think you'll even see people having, uh, like just, just have an amateur career as people who fight yeah. maybe maybe 10 years as an amateur and then go, right, well, actually, I'm going to park that on and maybe yeah. I'm going to go do something else that they don't want necessarily even go yeah. pro. Yeah, we're already seeing that, um, especially with, the, um, with some of the countries that are uh, state-sponsored. So, for example, the, the Russian team and um, the Kazakhstani team you might notice from um, Taekwondo as well. I, I believe it's similar in, in Taekwondo kickboxing, but those uh, those those countries have very very good sports state sponsorship, and it's actually more lucrative lucrative for them to remain as amateur athletes than to turn pro. Um, I, I spoke with um, spoke with one athlete at the last OCM Championships, and he was uh, he. He's an amateur athlete, but he has uh, a kind of, I suppose, an understanding with his his government, um, which is crazy to think that he's so close to his government. But um, he's literally on on a like he's got a, a scholarship, um, like a, they they pay him a grant for for being an athlete, and then he gets uh, cash um, bonuses every time he wins a fight. And then another cash bonus if he brings a gold medal home from the championships. And this could be, like this could like this particular athlete that I, that I spoke to um, was certainly on like 50, 60, 70,000 euro a year. Um, easy, easy as, a, as an amateur athlete. And he's at a level now where he can consistently knock out wins as, a, as an amateur, consistently, because he's that good that experience he's had like over over 20 odd fights at this stage and and um just he's just top of his game and like would you turn down a paycheck of 70 or 80 grand a year like you know on on, you know he'll he'll go and maybe maybe sign a contract with um uh cage warriors or bellator or 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 probably not ufc immediately but you get like the most he's going to earn in a year with, with a couple of fights there would be half of what he's getting now as an amateur for his first couple of fights. Yeah. Now, if he becomes like a massive name, like world, world famous name, then maybe he'll get a better contract. But uh, he's, he's certainly um, making enough to, to make it worthwhile to stay as an amateur right now. And, there's, yeah. and he's only one example of, of many. There's, there's many of them there. And it's always like, it's a challenge, I think, in a, a particularly martial arts but you know lots of sports that you're you're trying to like in Ireland you're you're trying to compete with these countries that have the that that state funding that are basically yep. nearly full time athletes. Their their job is to is to pretty much train and we're trying yep. to we're trying to fund ourselves and we're maybe trying to have jobs and it's it can be tough to compete against those type of people. Very, very tough. Very tough. But we're still doing it. Yeah. And uh Ireland um I know I know this carries across to all the different uh, martial arts but Ireland punches way above its weights at the international level. Um, and, and we've, we've uh, had the same in, in the MMA. We were like, I think we were fifth in the world um, finishing up in 20, 2019 or no, uh, 2018. We were fifth in the world. We dropped a few places in 2019, but um, like when you consider like the, 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 the likes of Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, team USA are, are, are funded. Um, you have uh, the Swedish MMA team are very very well organized, and then you have uh, the likes of uh, some of some of the the Middle Eastern com- uh, countries who who have like very lucrative sponsors. Uh, the team team Bahrain are, are very very well looked after, and and we're right up there alongside of all of them. Um, so yeah, we, we can we can certainly do it if we got a little bit of sponsorship from from our own government. Then I, I believe we would do better, but. Um, the game is the game is set. And these are the rules, and that's this is how we're going to compete. And we, we, there's no point in complaining about it. We just got to get on with it. And so then, for the like the IMF um, World Championships and, and that sort of uh, level, like what's the kind of what's the selection process to to qualify for mm-hmm. that? How often would they ha- How often are those major championships? So the the the. the over the last few years, the, the two that we've kind of uh, frequented would be the Europeans, which would normally be in the summer months, and then the Worlds, which would normally be in like October, November. 
Um, and unfortunately, they're, they're, they're like, like, like in, um, in taekwondo tournaments and, and, and kickboxing tournaments, they're self-funded. And, and athletes can expect to, to pay between 1,000 and 1,500 euro um, per trip. So that that kind of sorts some of the selection out uh, almost straight away. There's just, just athletes that can't that can't see themselves raising that money either. Either they they they're not um, clued in on how to get sponsorship, or they they just don't have the money to to pay out of their own pocket or or what have you. But um, so that has kind of uh, limited the selection. But over the last two to three years. I think people are really seeing the the benefit of the uh, like the guys who are going to the IMF tournaments and coming back and competing on the domestic circuit are are a different level. Um, they're, they're, the experience that they're gaining from that tournament is is becoming very apparent, and other athletes are are now making the sacrifices to get there. So the selection process is um, we we do squad set squad training sessions. Um, Andy Ryan is the uh, from Team Rhino. He's the the head coach for for Team Ireland. Um, I, I'm one of the team managers because I've been to uh, nine IMAF tournaments now, so I kind of I, I know the I know, I know the routine. Um, so I, I'm involved in it. Dino Wade is involved in it, um, and we have a, a load of other coaches that that kind of if they've got athletes in the running, they'll chip in and 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 help out as well. But the selection process is based on first off who turns up. If somebody is not turning up to squad training; they're not even considered. Secondly, their track record. If they've competed at IMAF events already, then you know they, there's a certain uh, kind of ranking that goes with that. Uh, if they've medaled, certainly their 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 um, their their place on the team is is uh, is a lot safer. But also, they have to be active within the within the last twelve months. So if they're inactive in the last twelve months, then they go right down the bottom of the pile as well. Um, and then we literally just go through them um, weight class by weight class. We, we we have the opportunity to bring two athletes per weight class, um, and then we try and have an alternate as well because you'd always get an injury. You'd always get somebody that uh, for some reason uh, a month out can't make the tournament or whatever. So so yeah, we do we do the best we can. Um, by and large, the teams that we've brought out have, haven't been. Um, there's nobody complained about who's who's represented Ireland in any weight class in the last few years. Uh, we've had some phenomenal, um, phenomenal athletes representing the country, um, and most of them, most of them, will be very big on the pro scene within the next two to three years. Yeah, one hundred percent. How often then do you have? How often are the squad sessions held then? We try and get a session once a month. Um, we we had we had three planned uh, February, March, April. That obviously can not happen at the moment. Uh, but I suppose the other thing is that the the championships have been postponed for this year as well. So the Europeans are off now. So um, it looks like the next IMAF event won't be until the Worlds in November. So we've got a bit of breathing space to try and pick a team and. Uh, head out there. Um, so there's 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 a there's the world championship. Sorry, is in Kazakhstan in October, and then there's a, a world's team event, which is a new type of uh, concept that they're trying at the moment, and that's going to be in Bahrain in uh, December, I think. So we've got those two events, and and we'll try and hopefully, if restrictions lift over the summer months, then we can get back into a routine and start kind of looking at selecting a team for the, for those events. Yeah, because like from the taekwondo point of view, is we we in a lead up to like we had the European Championships was going to be on in in April, it's going to be on a few uh, I think next week it was and uh, but we'd have squad sessions every every two weeks pretty much and only really you'd, it might go a little bit longer if you had a, a local competition kind of in the middle that would disrupt that, that kind of schedule and I think yeah. that we really benefited from the fact that we're a small country and you can get everybody together every so often like it's maybe you can get anywhere in the country in three hours whereas a lot of those yeah. bigger countries they, they, they can't because they're just like they're mm. so spread out that like that it's maybe some countries don't have any squad sessions and I think we really have to get the benefit of getting all the best people together every so often yeah. and train yeah, that's a good point and do, do, do you good feel point. like the, the 
the, the like your side on the MMA might have benefits somewhat something similar. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that, but um, definitely, definitely. We have um, the first couple of times we went to IMF tournaments. I was actually only uh, uh, talking about this recently in one of my uh, videos, but um, the 2015 in Birmingham. Uh, that was the first time I went to an IMF tournament and I, I had uh, Ryan Spillan uh, was competing there. He was making uh, his IMF debut. And he, uh, at that time, I actually didn't know any of the other coaches or athletes on the Irish team. We all literally arrived in different planes. At diff we were staying in different hotels. We were literally introducing ourselves to each other on the side of the warm-up mats. Um, but uh, nowadays we travel as one team. Uh, the team selection is done, and when we when we go to these events, we're we're not Team SPG or Team Rhino or or MMA Cork or you know what a, a Scene Mac or any other team. We're Team Ireland, and that's it. Um, and everybody chips in and um, supports each other. So um, that's definitely that that is a good point. That because we're such a small island, that we do get the opportunity to meet each other pre pre-tournament and uh, build up that team vibe so yeah that's a good point actually i didn't think of it that way yeah and so would you be would you promote more so the the imaf route or in terms mm. of like amateur progression more so the imaf route then mm. then um we'll say maybe fighting on local shows or uh yes i i don't believe that um the the, the commercial saturday night event is actually amateur mma at all um if i had an option I would never do a Saturday night show again. Um, I, 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 they're a necessary evil at the moment. That's the only way that we can um, run regular events in Ireland um, the, because the cost of, a, of an IMAF style tournament is, is totally prohibitive um, with, with, with our current setup. But um, let's say the, 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 the reason I don't think that they're amateur uh, number one, fighters are are selling tickets. There's there's a pressure on uh, amateur athletes. We say fighting for a cage legacy or or a, a battle zone or a cage warriors when they come into town. If you want to be on uh, that and you you want to be invited back and uh, again and again, the promoters are are looking for you to sell tickets. Now I'm not blaming the promoters for this. The promoters are trying to uh, make it financially possible to run the show. They, they have to cover bills. Like we promote a show ourselves and we ask fighters to sell tickets. But then that's not amateur anymore. If, if you're in the business of selling tickets, then it's not amateur. You're, you're basically a professional that's not being paid now. Um, and I, it, it, it's, it's a different environment as well. I mean, you, you're, you're six, eight weeks, 10 weeks promoting one fight. One fight. And there's so much pressure on that and all your friends and family are there to watch you either win or lose. And uh, it's just, it, it, it's enormous pressure. The IMF tournament is completely different. You're under no pressure to sell tickets. There's no walk-up music. There's no uh, bright DJ lights and ring card girls and uh, there's no screaming drunk fans or anything like that. You go out, you focus entirely on the sport, on your performance, on getting through this fight and into the next fight, and you, you gain more experience faster and uh, under less uh, mental stress than the Saturday night show. Um, I, I absolutely believe that it's the, that's the the correct format for amateur. It, it's more like what I'm what I've been used to in in karate and what, what you're used to from Taekwondo as well. It's that environment. So I, I it, that's 100% the way to go. The, the Saturday night shows are cool. I, I, I loved fighting in Neptune Stadium myself. Um, it's a buzz, you know, it's like a showcase. But um, if, that's, if that's your starting ground, it's, it's not healthy. That should be like you, you get a good shot of fights underneath you. So you know you, you're confident in your game. You're, you're, uh, you have nothing to prove to anybody, and you just want to put on a show. Then, by all means, go have a have have a big party in a in in Neptune Stadium and and and, and put on a show. Excellent, but uh, for for the long term development of the sport and the athletes, we need more IMAF style um, events at a local level and and national level.
Yeah, but so, like, you can say maybe the, the, the IMAF is more, it, it can develop uh, the competitive style and the competitive experience more so than the Saturday night show. But would you think mm-hmm. that as an amateur, maybe the Saturday, having one or two Saturday night shows could potentially be beneficial if you're looking to push into a pro career, like to have that experience. Yes. You've stepped out in the crowd. Yes. The first time you're stepping out in the, a Saturday night show is a pro mm-hmm. debut. That wouldn't be beneficial. Yeah. There, so maybe there no, is. no, you, you you need it there. It's 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 the bridging gap. It's semi pro. That's why like I, I'm I'm calling it semi pro. You definitely, I mean, like, and they're two different games. I mean, some 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 uh, really really great amateurs end up being broke pros. You know, not making much money because uh, you know they um, they don't believe in hyping themselves up and um, you know creating drama and stuff like that. But Unfortunately, that's the game at pro level. If you want to make some money, you have to you, you have to move the needle, as Dana White says. You know, you have to you have to sell tickets, and it, that's it. You're 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 a ticket salesman. Once you turn into in, in into that game, um, you, you sell a lot of tickets partly by winning fights and uh, having an exciting style and and being technically brilliant. But there's a whole other side of of, of marketing and um, social media branding and um, just being a, a, a the type of personality that people want to listen to and talk to and and, and you know there's so much to the game. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely. I'm after to to develop the sport and to uh, learn the sport and get good at it. Um, Saturday night show to to practice being a pro. Then pro, yeah. That's that's that would be a good uh, progression. I think even you've seen, like you said, the benefit of it's. It can be very similar the IMAF uh, tournaments to a uh, taekwondo competition, a kickboxing tournament. And I think just just one example that just kind of jumps to mind is a, is Sean O'Bannon, who would have been mm-hmm. very used to that style of going away, having a number of fights. And um, yeah. like I said it was maybe not so much what like very similar. I think that she had that success there at the mm-hmm. last worlds where, where somebody like you said maybe they've had two night shows and yep. then they're going away to this tournament and then it's a completely different field to what they're used to and maybe they can't perform yep. it, it can be it, it's it's a different environment so it's hard like, well, what, the, the biggest thing that the, the biggest thing that happens to people who are used to fighting one fight at a time is um uh, and this happened to a lot of the guys that who were very successful on the on the domestic circuit and maybe had that success hasn't translated into imaf uh, um success is um you go out and you have your first fight and you've, you you absolutely nail your opponent you you knock them out or you fly through them whatever then you have that big adrenaline dump at the end of the fight it's like oh fight over time to go have a kebab you know get fat whatever and it's very very hard for people to get used to switching it back on again for the following day like a lot of people are are like you know they 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 lose their second fight purely on mentally being switched off, uh, not because of uh, of not physically being better than their opponent. So I don't know—is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's just different. It's just different. It is it, the the tournament style is a different style, um, and, and it's something that any any um, any amateur fighter that wants to gain experience has to get used to. Um, the advantage to that is that you can, if you do well at these tournaments, you can get five fights in five days. That would take you at least a year, if not 18 months to do on the domestic circuit. So there's your trade-off. And I, I would absolutely take the, the, the experience over the, the, the glitz and glamour any day. And is the IMAF then, is that a way in every day or is that one way in at the start of the week and then you compete the whole way through? No, you have to weigh in every morning that you fight, and there's no allowance. So, like they will literally disqualify you if you're point one of a kg overweight, um, and and you only get to weigh in once as well, uh, as in like once that day. So there's an official scales, and there's like a there, there's a, a member of staff that's in charge of that scales, and once you set foot on that scales, that's your weight. You don't get a like a, a, um, in a domestic show here and, and uh, the pros get it as well if you miss weight you get an hour to go off and try and lose that extra same pound or two same. You'd, have that, you'd have that yeah. hour yeah so you don't get that in, in, in IMAF there's a test scales that is usually within 
like 20 meters of the of the official scales so everybody comes down and strips off and jumps on the scales and uh, that should be within like 0.1 or 0.2 kgs of the it should be the same but you know uh, not always um and then like you, you do that you check there if you're not on weight there then go off and uh, do a few laps at the car park or whatever um, and then come back in but do not step on the scales unless you're 100 percent sure that you are underweight at that stage um and uh, actually one of the um, one of the uh, kickboxing uh, athletes from cork uh, dear Beglia, and you probably know dear Beglia, do you uh, she, she just fights on out the, just on the podcast oh yes. brilliant oh yeah. brilliant you know so so um d was in uh, bahrain with us um 2018 and uh, I think I think it was her first IMAF um, and obviously she was used to the the um, the KBI uh, wackos the, the wacko worlds and stuff like that so um, she she like I was freaking out because the, the like the the weigh in time was between I think 6 and 7 a.m. this was like 5 to 7 and like one, once you hit 7 a.m., they close the scales. That's it. If you're not weighed in at that stage, you're out of the tournament. And I was like, where, where's Deirdre? Where, where is she? And uh, uh, people were saying, oh, she's just in the sauna there just trying to sweat off the last kilo. I was like, fucking get her. Got, you know, like we have to be weighed in now, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, literally. Uh, and it was in, like she was in the female sauna. And this was in like a, a Middle Eastern country where like you, you like men and women don't, don't, don't associate in, in like, in those circles at all like it's not it's not a unisex sauna by any means so i had to find another female athlete send her in after deirdre and we literally made the scales with a minute to go and she was just on weight i mean like literally just on weight um but she would have been disqualified um yeah. so it's a it's it's a stressful stressful part of the tournament but it's a it's it's fair play for everyone you know um, and that's one of the things that that, that IMAF are, are really really good for. That it's like there's one rule for everyone. There's there's nobody gets away with anything. Um, but you you know that the the rules are strict for you, but they're strict for everybody else as well. And at least you know when you step into the cage that uh, or your athlete steps into the cage that you're fighting somebody who is on weight. And and that's that's a good thing. And how after how long would you have between stepping on the scales and before you step out for your first fight? Um, so it depends. It depends on what weight class you are. Uh, so the the way the, the weigh-ins are usually six between six and seven a.m. or seven and eight p.m. They're early in the morning. Uh, you go off, then you have to have your pre-fight medicals. Then you go and um, you uh, have breakfast. Then there's like a, a bus to take you to the venue, or maybe maybe the hotel and the venue are in the, in the one uh, building. But uh, you got to get to the venue next. Then you got to get your hands wrapped. Um, and get all your get equipment. All your- so the, the like the the rash guard, the shorts come fresh every day. So you've got to go find your equipment and uh, your gloves and your shin pads, everything that. And, and then you have like a there's a a kind of a production line of warm up areas where you have like the, the the changing areas. Then you have the pre warm up areas. Then you have the 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 pre fight warm up area. Then you have the staging area. Then you have the the cage. So there's a whole production line to that. But they go in order of weight so the 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 female atom weights are usually first on in the morning and then the male super heavy weights are last on in the evening the first fight would be 11 a.m and the last fight may be 7 or 8 p.m so it depends on what weight class you are so a long day for a coach a very very long day for a coach and we have to be there um and, and that's the thing coaches have to pay the same amount of money as the athletes so when i go to an imaf tournament it costs me 1500 euro every time i go to an imaf tournament and uh i when, when i'm there i might i might have i usually have uh, at least two or more athletes of my own to be there but if even on the times when i have one um i'm there to Make sure that the entire team are weighed in correctly and that they're cornered and they're looked after all day long. So, uh, yeah, it's a very, very long day. Myself and Andy Ryan and Dino Wade are, are usually age about 10 years in five days. Uh, I, I believe it, yeah. <laughs> and uh, today, another thing I see that you run out of the gym is the, the Wimp to Warrior program. 
Uh, what's uh, the kind of uh, the, the background to that and your kind of the take on mm. the benefits of, of that? Yeah, so this is um, this is I suppose it's it's not new anymore, but it was new uh, four or five years ago. Another trend or status quo about MMA was that it was just for prime athletes. It was just for we say girls and guys in their in their twenties that you know were just hard, you know, like real animals and and you know. Uh, the quintessential fighter uh, personality type. Um, but in terms of the world development of our sport, you, you need a very, very, uh, it, it, it can't just be all prime athletes. And, and it's just not financially feasible for a sport to be built on a very, very tiny percentage of athletes and everybody else just, just in watching. That's, that's, like no no other sport is built like that. Every other sport has a progression path and has a, a place for everybody to 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 be there and to take part and 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 do their bit. And there is, I mean, like MMA has become a, a, a hugely popular sport. It's stating the obvious there, but it's it's not like it's impossible for for people to do. It's actually very very possible for people to do, and it's very beneficial for everybody to do. As long as people are matched correctly, as long as somebody who's, uh, who's at one ability level is paired off with somebody at another ability level and on, uh, they're looked after well by, by referees and coaches and everything like that, it's, it's very, very safe. It's probably as safe as any other. Um, it's actually, in Ireland, even more safe than most other contact sports. But, um, yeah, and it, it so... The idea behind Wimp to Warrior, Richie Cranny from uh, Sydney in Australia, he's actually a Londoner, but uh, moved out to Sydney uh, 20 odd years ago. He was, um, he was running a, 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 his own commercial gym, training fighters, um, struggling to keep the doors of the gym open because uh, like fighters are only a very tiny percentage of the population of, of, of uh, we say, the available uh, clientele. And... Um, he decided he was going to recruit some 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 new members. So he put up a, a challenge on his Facebook page. Said, "Look, I am going to train somebody for six months and put them uh, and and get them fight ready. Who wants it? Who 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 wants this? Um, who wants to do this?" And he got like five hundred uh, requests. So uh, that that became season one of Wimp to Warrior, and 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 he figured out a kind of a format around it, and it became what it is today. But what it has evolved to is it's it's a way for people who are not necessarily in the prime of life um, who want to have the experience of um, training MMA just like those the, the, their their um, their idols in MMA and having that one go at just stepping into a cage and having a fight. Um, and initially, it was, we were kind of like, "Is this white collar boxing for MMA?" And no, it's not. It's it's totally different. It's it's six months, and it's like five days a week, and it's a very very involved process. It, there's a, there's a lot to it. There's a big commitment, and um, the results that we've seen from like we've done, we're on season seven now. We've had over over three hundred people come through the gym to do uh, Wimp to Warrior in the last four, four years. And every single one of them has had some sort of a transformation, whether it be uh, physically, mentally, or, or like uh, mental health wise, they, they've absolutely all benefited massively. We've had the, the, the people who come in and do it as a bucket list item have uh, come in they're, they They retire after one fight and they say, thanks a million, loved it but I'm never doing it again. And then you have people who use it as a stepping stone to become amateur athletes. We've got a uh, three on our fight team that, that went through the Wimps Warrior process. Um, so it, it, it's kind of like a, a kind of a, it's a great starting point for, for people or it's a great uh, safety net for, for people, it, depending on what way you want to, to look at it. But um, if, as a gym, it has helped us to um, to really lock down the way that we teach MMA 
um, so we we've had to we've had to like before we went to worry we we were like you know casually just trotting along we we'll do okay we'll do open guard this week we'll do close guard this week we'll do uh, striking wrestling whatever like that but when you have a bunch of people who have never done the sport before and they're going to fight in six months time now the pressure is on what do you need to teach them that's absolutely essential you've you've got a limited amount of time and you've got to make them fight ready and uh safe to compete in mma so cut out all the crap all the 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 stuff that maybe doesn't work for everybody and only teach the pure fundamentals that work for everybody regardless of of their body type regardless of their age regardless of their fitness level and funnily enough that same system works just as well for the prime athletes and and our our fight team got better because of the Wimpton Warrior process. So it, it was a win-win all around for us. and it, It's a phenomenal program. Yeah, like, as you see, as you said, a lot of other sports, anybody, like if you want to play soccer, you can maybe go and you could play something like a five-a-side. There's a, all levels. Exactly. Like, Merlin Gaelic football, there's, mm-hmm. you can play all different grades. But at a time, I suppose, in MMA, there was either you're going to be, be a pro and want to be in the UFC Mm. or you're probably not going or to it wasn't a place for you exactly yeah. exactly and that's not feasible as a sport you can't build a sport like that we want i mean like i i, I love the pro game i love seeing you know the ufc events the bellator events the ksw events all, all these events around i love watching them but for those to be uh, uh financially successful in the long term there needs to be a wide base of people who are invested in the sport in, in terms of like that they're fans of the sport, that they have a, a um, they have some sort of a connection to the sport. That's how we make sure that the, the sport is is strong into the future. And having uh, IMAF now have uh, team uh, championships as well. They have the Youth World Championships, which is where they have uh, modified rule sets for MMA for uh there's, there's three age brackets. So there's the 12 and 13 year olds are called youth C. The 14 and 15 are called youth B. And the 16, 17 are uh, youth A. And uh, they had their first uh, championships for that in August last year. And the level was frightening. Those kids, once they, once they turn 18, the rest of us should just retire because they're just going to absolutely kick the snot out of everyone. They're so, so sharp and, and, it, it, like we, we we often talk about like Rory McDonald and and uh, we say people of his generation being the first true mixed martial artists where they're not really specialists in anything. These kids are specialists in MMA. It, it, they've they've taken it a whole other level altogether. Um, like you're seeing you're seeing um, the fusion of like the aggression and uh, the, the the adrenaline of wrestling. And in that same energy, locking on an arm bar or choking somebody out two seconds later. Do you know, it's not it, like uh, Phil Mulpeter, the honey badger was, was over in uh, the youth games in, in, in August. And he was looking at it. And he was like, he was just like shocked at, at some of the kids and how aggressive they were with their jujitsu style. Jiu-jitsu style. He was like, you're supposed to play jujitsu. You're not supposed to attack. Ju-. Like, do you know, these guys were so yeah. aggressive with their jujitsu, but uh, yeah. So so just widening the net all overall, and and the other the other part of it is like, like just in type it, like in taekwondo and, and kickboxing, we need officials, we need cuts people, we need uh, referees, and there's there, there's there's a place for people who maybe not uh, able to fight or maybe in, uh, not in a position to coach, but they can still be part of the sport as officials. Um, I mean. Taekwondo tournaments wouldn't run without without a, a very strong team of umpires. Um, in in the Waco Kickboxing Championships, you have uh, like the, some of the referees are uh, are as well known as some of the athletes. I know in in West Cork you have uh, 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 D, D Begley's dad, uh, Shane Begley is one of the the referees, and um, Mike Stevenson as well as one of the referees. I, I I don't even do kickboxing. And I know those referees. Yeah. And also, uh, and in in IMAF now we have uh, one of our lads, Derek Hickey. Uh, he he's been a member of the gym since we opened the doors. 
and he's now one of the top referees in IMAF. He he won um, the the IMAF official of the year in 2019, um, and I, like that that's that wasn't an easy title to come across. Like he he had to be he had to be on top of his game for a very very long time in order to earn that prize. I mean, he's 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 refed pro fights and amateur fights and like thousands of fights now at this stage and. Hopefully he's he's another court man that we might see on the UFC stage as well as a referee, and that's awesome. That's that's a wide class. Oh, he's going to make it. Don't worry. Don't worry. He's going to make it. It's it's. Um, there's a couple of UFC events coming up, and and his name has already been um, thrown into the hat. Um, so like because it was Mark Goddard that uh, that that nominated him for the for the uh, official of the year award. Um, and as you know, Mark is one of the main referees in the UFC. So, um, yeah, he's he's going to be there. He's going to be there, and and that's great. And we've got um, got loads of people who are like the the Jacob Stitch Duran of of Ireland. You know, uh, the, these cuts people in the corner. Um, we have Jess Isaacson and uh, Deborah O'Sullivan, and uh, there's there's loads loads of uh, of uh, people who are again. Not going to be MMA fighters, but they are in there contributing to the community and 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 uh, making sure that our sport has ha, has a, a long and healthy future. Yeah, so the, that kind of brings me on to the next thing I just may want to touch on is uh, often I think it, it has changed massively, but you still see uh, people in the media MMA gets a bad name, and I suppose most notably it's. Uh, Maybe Joe Brawley has been in recent times as he has a big platform mm. and has been has criticised MMA. What do you what do you kind of think of that? Kind yeah, of a- I do you know what it'll it'll just take a little, little bit more time. I mean, uh, we're we're seeing we're seeing people come come around to it more and more as as the years go by. But the the important thing is that is how how you how you fight back on it. Um, it it's important that we don't kind of uh, go on the defensive about it and become aggressive in in the way that we um rebut some of the arguments that come our way so if they say oh these these lads are a load of scumbags and uh you know they're they're nothing but caged animals and it's voyeurism and it's not real sport and then we say fuck you do you know then we're just playing right into that argument you know what we need to be doing is as a community and as as a sport is uh, getting our act together and proving why we're not those things. And this is something that uh, IMA is doing. So IMA is the Irish MMA Association, which is basically our, our version of, um, which which uh, you're a part of um, Taekwondo ITA. Ireland, isn't it? ITA. Yeah. So it's just like, it's kind of similar to that, right? Um, so we, uh, we we have lots of different initiatives. Um, Ashling is the administrator there for that, and there's a there's a, a very strong committee there, including Dino Wade, John Cavanagh, Andy Ryan, uh, Tim Murphy from Galway. Uh, they, they, there's there's a bunch of uh, people all working in the background to push positive news stories out there and, and highlight the stuff that um, Irish MMA clubs are doing that that benefit the community, in, including. A bunch of all of the clubs are doing free women's self-defense classes. Um, a bunch of the clubs are doing uh, um, classes for disadvantaged youths. Um, you know, Owen Roddy had a whole program where it, it, Owen Roddy is uh, uh, Kavanagh's um, uh, Padman, also uh, one of the OGs of the Irish fight uh, game. And uh, he runs uh, SBG Charlestown. And he had a, a, a scholarship program for like the youths in his area where he brought, like I think it was like, 40 or 50 teens in and, and, and coach them for free over like over a few months um, and you know gave, gave some of them memberships and stuff like that so there's a lot of stuff like that going on and this is how we handle the media we push the positives focus on the positives don't get don't don't feed the trolls when it comes to the negatives and obviously you know uh, we we want uh, our role models to be strong in, in 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 the positive side of things as well, bearing in mind that the pro game and the amateur game are completely separate. And what we need to focus on is the amateur game because that's where the the kids of tomorrow are going to be um, uh, 
learning their craft. And that's where the, the parents are going to be sending their kids is to an amateur sport. They're not going to be sending them to the UFC. Do you know? Not yet. Yeah, well, that's I suppose that, that's the thing. It's the the spotlight tends to get uh, get get shined on the on the on the pro game and and, and only the pros. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's very it's very narrow of what what the sport can be like. When like you said, that there is actually a much broader community and much a much broader uh, aspect to to what actually goes on in the sport. Yeah, definitely. Focus on the positives. That's the only thing we can do. And 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 there's a hell of a lot of positives there. Like the 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 amount of um, good that a healthy career in MMA or a healthy hobby in MMA can do for a person far outweighs the the you know the negatives that uh, getting getting a, a scrap every so often will do for you. You know. Yeah, and it's the it's a funny thing I find that I, 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 for myself, you know, sometimes people maybe think like, oh, like oh, would you be, like this idea that you'd be nearly fighting every Saturday night but I could I was absolutely I've never been in a fight outside of outside of uh, mm-hmm. competition and I think that's what it actually it actually brings to martial arts is you find most of them outside of competition are never in fights or never in those situations because they know yeah. how to talk to, they know how to talk themselves out of it they know how to maneuver it, and they're not looking for it it's actually it doesn't train people it doesn't um, encourage people to fight it actually nearly encourages them to move away from it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a better challenge in, in a tournament coming up the road or whatever, you know. So um yeah. No, they, yeah. I, I like we as martial artists we we like we're we're kind of I suppose even the listeners to this podcast we're preaching to the converted like when, when we, we talk about the positives of, of, of martial arts. But I suppose what we need to do as martial artists is is learn how to communicate with the non martial artists and, and remind them that, you know, um there's a lot, a lot of good coming out of, of 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 any of the martial arts communities, whether it be MMA or Taekwondo or Karate or or, or what have you. You know, it's it, it, we're 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 positively um, contributing to communities all over the country, and uh, that's what we need to push. Um, there's no point in trying to defend uh, a, some of the arguments like the, the the whole kind of barbarism stuff like that. There's no point because you, you're not really going to convince um, the person who is launching those assaults at, at, at the sport. The, the likes of Joe Brawley is never going to be convinced that MMA is, is, is anything but what he thinks it is. But the people who are listening to the debate, the, 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 the thousands of people who are reading his, um, his articles and then following the comments down below, they're making their mind up on what the replies are, not not on what the main article is. So, uh, we've got to be clever in how we uh, approach that, and 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 just don't feed the trolls. Just stay positive, focus on focus on the the good things that we're all doing within our communities, and uh, eventually people will come around. Uh, two quick questions before we finish up. If you had to pick a favorite fighter of all time, who would you pick? Hmm. Um, so, I think the un- most one of the most underrated fighters of all time, I think, is Cain Velasquez. Um, I, I love uh, watching Cain Velasquez fights, and I, I I'm disappointed that he didn't um, reach the the heights that I think he could have. Um, I think uh, he was a victim of a training too intensely uh, during fight camp. I think he could have done with. Uh, with kind of taking it a little bit easier during training camps, training a bit more smartly and protecting his body. But um, George St. Pierre, um, a- another huge uh, inspiration of mine um, because he's a karate guy, um, came from a, a Kyokushin karate background and um, I saw him do some some katas as well. Um, yeah, so those two, of course, Mr. McGregor, um, and Gunnar Nelson, like there's so many, there's so many. Yeah. If you had to pick maybe a, a favorite fight, who would who would it be? What, 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 uh, for two for two fights to or two UFC fighters to fight each other, or for me to fight them? <laughs> that wouldn't be much of a fight, I tell you. Favorite fight that you, you would have watched if you're going to maybe turn on your yeah, turn on a fight to watch. What what are you going to turn on? Um. I'd like to see how MVP and Stephen Wonderboy Thompson will get along. I think they're they're in the same weight class, and I think uh, 
coming from a kickboxing point sparring style uh, uh, myself and I, I'd be interested to see how they handle each other um, I don't know there's so many great fights I mean we have to clear out this this, this uh, lightweight division with, between uh, Tony Ferguson Khabib Connor and uh, Justin Gaethje and uh, uh, Dustin Poirier like that that they all have to fight um I would like to see Ryan Bader up against some of the the, the UFC heavyweights again. I think he's uh, I think he's after developing hugely um, since leaving the UFC, and and he's a different fighter now. Um, a Gegard Mousasi uh, fighting some of the uh, the uh, UFC middleweights. I'd like to see that. Uh, there's nice. there's loads of fights. I I could I I can't I can't tie down to one. I'm, I'm my memory isn't good enough to, to think of all the fighters and the possibilities and the permutations. <laughs> so, yeah, look, actually, there'd be some good fights. And um, I think we'll actually wrap it up there. Um, I have to say, I've really enjoyed the chat. Um, I've learned a few things about the, the kind of the setup of behind it, where you, I only see bits and pieces, uh, I suppose, on social media. At, uh, I've had a chance to um, to see, to, to find out about the, the IMAP kind of setup. So I've really enjoyed the chat. Awesome. Well, uh, it, like definitely, if if there's any uh, of your listeners that are involved in MMA at any stage, make sure that the make sure that they pressure their coaches to get involved in IMAF tournaments because it definitely is the way to the future. And uh, everybody out there, go check my YouTube channel as well. I just uh, uh, just go Liam O'Griffin MMA coach on YouTube. I have a couple of uh, couple of videos gone up in the last few weeks. I'm making use of my time during this lockdown. I'm getting I'm getting uh, upskilled on YouTube, so. Um, a few stories of my guys uh, fighting on there and um, a few tutorials and stuff like that so check that out very very interesting thing that I think that uh, maybe you could see a lot of gyms doing in the future is that type of thing so uh, so a cool kind of uh, initiative that you, you have going there awesome but, uh, so yeah. are, are you have you got a, a fight coming up yourself or tournaments coming up uh, we say after the lockdown so the Europeans are, 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 are any talk of them being rescheduled or uh not from what I'm here. Well, they were hoping, but I think they were hoping maybe in June. But I think where we're at right now is uh, is it's going to be cancelled. There was meant to be a World Cup in October. Again, that's that's kind of it's touch and go whether that will actually go ahead. Um, yeah. But by the time people get back to even the thing is, come October you could hold it. But if people haven't been in the gyms and, and haven't been in the clubs training, you're not going to go up and up yeah. there. So, so I think that's kind of the thing then as well. So yeah, I think they're going to have to. I think they're still going to have to go ahead and do it because uh, otherwise we'll never get back on track. You know, it might be, it might be a a, a a tournament where everybody's a little bit fatter than usual. But look, just get the ball back rolling and and, and we'll take it from there. We'll improve one step at a time. But uh, yeah, I'll keep an eye on your page anyway to see where uh, how your training is going and how the tournament scene is going. Lovely stuff. Uh, so t- thanks a million for coming on. No worries at all, man. No all worries. Right. And uh, thank you. Cheers. Will do. Awesome. Thank you.